Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Um, this is Drupal Strategies for Nonprofits. If you happen to be in the wrong room, now's a good time to leave. Uh, my name is Scott Reinen, and I am lead developer at a company called Atten Design Group. And there's my email if you want to contact me after this. Okay. Morning. Uh, my name is Lydia Tupin, and I'm the studio manager at Atten Design Group. Um, Atten Design Group is a web strategy design and development firm. We're based in Denver, Colorado in the U.S. We've been working with nonprofits and NGOs for about 12 years since we started our company. We've had um, some great clients and had the privilege to work with uh, museums like the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, with international development organizations like the United Nations Development Program, and with journalism organizations like the Pointer Institute. So over the past 12 years, we've learned a lot about working with nonprofits and about working with Drupal, of course. <laughs> so today, Scott and I are going to talk about, um, thanks. We're going to talk about Drupal strategies for nonprofits. Specifically, I'm going to go over some examples of Drupal sites that we've done for nonprofit clients, and then Scott's going to talk about um, distributions, contributions, and collaboration with the community. Uh, but first, I'd like to get an idea of who's here. So how many of you in the room work in design or development shops or are freelancers? Okay. Okay, great. And um, how many of you work for nonprofit organizations or agencies? Fantastic. <laughs> That's wonderful. Great. Well, um, I am not a designer or a developer, although I work with quite a few very good ones. Um, but I do have some nonprofit experience. I was actually raised in West Africa. I spent about 11 years there as a child with my brothers who also work for Atten. And uh, during that time, uh, living in the people group that we lived in, we saw some of the severe issues facing people. And I know that that goes beyond the group that I was living in to many parts of the world. Um, issues that are threatening lives and livelihoods, uh, political unrest, lack of education, lack of clean water, lack of health care. So at this point in my life, I'm just very grateful to be a part of a team that's helping to do this kind of good work for larger organizations who are doing uh, large international good work as well. It's an interesting niche to be in today, but I'm just really appreciative of that opportunity. So um, I'd like to talk about Drupal a little bit. Drupal is, oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. Can you go to the next? Thanks. Uh, fast becoming a um, leading solution for some of these issues that are facing nonprofits. And we don't have a lot of time to get into the detail, but I want to cover a few of those points. Uh, first, we're seeing that financial partners, donors, and funders for nonprofits want to give their money to groups that are doing the most good and creating the longer lasting impacts, and also to groups that are able to maintain a very high level of accountability about the work that they're doing. So donors want to know what's happening with their money, and they want the most out of it. This requires a level of accountability from nonprofits that depends on quick communication and the ability to quickly share information. Uh, this was not possible uh, in years past, certainly. Um, much of the world it can in, much of the world it can take and has taken weeks to get reports from one country to another. As an example, uh, when I was a child, my parents kept in touch with their colleagues on a radio every morning. And as a teenager, the closest internet connection was eight hours away over dirt roads. And then once you arrived there, you could only get internet access if the phone lines were up and the power was on, and they often were not. So we've come a long way in the past um, decade and a half. Uh, Part, uh, another issue with this um, idea of accountability is an expectation by funders and a goal by nonprofits themselves to see the money going to the actual work that they're doing. So, for example, if I'm working with a nonprofit providing for children in Africa, I don't want that money scooped up to, into admin overhead in Paris or DC. I want to know that those children are actually being provided for out of the funds that we're managing. 
So um, again, the web has been changing, it continues to change, and it's being used less today as a billboard style marketplace and more of a robust tool for communication, collaboration, information sharing. There's an ability to literally invite the entire world to be a part of your work, it's pretty awesome. And then to provide those partners with the tools they need to confidently continue their involvement. Organizations can now keep the public and their donors up to date on their progress and on their needs. This raises awareness, which is great. It also creates more funding, which is great. And um, ultimately, it advances the good work that's being done. Okay. Uh, so this is where Drupal comes in. Drupal provides the tools needed by the nonprofits and by uh, and the tools that partners, financial partners, are looking for. And because of the large community collaboration in the Drupal community, it's very similar to that of the nonprofit community, we see that time and costs can be saved. So Scott's gonna talk a little bit later about functionality and customization available in Drupal and in the distributions and how that can cut overhead for web development while still answering specific and varied needs for different clients. So like I said earlier, we've worked with many nonprofits over the years. And each of them have had very different missions, goals um, for their work, but we've noticed some similarities in their web development needs. It was these similarities and a lot of contribution that led to our release of the Open Aid distribution. And Open Aid is our response to some of the issues facing nonprofits and sort of how to respond to those. So I'd like to share some examples of the client work that's helped to clarify these needs and then eventually to shape the Open Aid distribution. Um, International Center for Journalists. Uh, ICFJ strives to be a catalyst for change through good journalism. They believe that independent media is crucial to improving the human condition. Their work is pretty awesome. They are partnering with the Pointer Institute, which is another journalism program, um, organization, to provide training and support for journalists around the world and specifically in countries where it is extremely difficult to tell the truth about things and often life-threatening to do so. ICFJ seeks to strengthen societies through accountable relationships with their partners, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Knight Foundation. In addition to this uh, providing of tools and resources, they are also trying to educate the public on what they're doing. So during our discovery process with ICFJ, we found they had some specific requirements for their web presence. And we'll just go through some of these slides that might be a bit a bit quick, the um, screenshots. An image carousel. Uh, ICFJ uses an image carousel to quickly communicate uh, the work that they're doing and the stories that they're covering. The news section is presented in a blog style. It includes search capabilities. Uh, Multi-author blogs. ICFJ has a variety of blog contributors worldwide, so this gives them the opportunity to um, present author information on the right and then the uh, blogs down the, the middle. Profile pages. Provide detailed information about contributors and partners with space for related projects and social media coverage. Program pages, this section allows ICFJ to focus on their projects, so they can include video, images, information about the individuals working in those projects, and event information. Mapping on ICFJ's site um, is worked into their program pages, so basically if you click on a point on the map, it takes you directly to the program page associated with that area. And partner profiles, this is of course extremely important to any nonprofit. It gives a place to present uh, partner information and these of course are the groups and people making the work possible. And a resource library. This provides a, ICFJ provides a lot of resources on their site and these are searchable by language. So the second client I'd like to go over is International Center for Transitional Justice. I had no idea who these people were when um, we started this project and this idea of transitional justice was a new one to me. ICTJ works, um, a transitional justice refers to measures taken in the wake of massive human rights violations. So this group is coming in after things like genocide, war crimes, child slavery, gender oppression, and they're partnering with government and non-government organizations to, uh, I don't want to say clean up societies, but um, they're uh, working with 
uh, the criminal perpetrators and also with the victims to make sure that people who are responsible for these atrocities are being held accountable and to work with societies to make sure that there's not repeat atrocities. It's, if you have a chance to uh, look this side up, it's pretty amazing. So during our discovery process with ICTJ, we defined the following requirements for their website. An image carousel, like ICFJ that we saw before, they're using an image carousel here to quickly communicate their work to their audience. News section, these items are presented chronologically. There's associated topics listed uh, on the bottom of each item for more reading. Profile pages, again, this gives a space for detailed information on ICTJ's leadership, their staff, and their partners. Program pages, there's a lot of room for images here with room for news and updates on the sidebar. And mapping, this map works a little different than the first client um, that we saw. These, in this site, the program pages are actually the countries, so the map's been customized in Drupal to work in two separate ways for two different clients that needed two different things. ICTJ uses a lot of photographs to communicate with their users, so there are several image galleries on their site that they can um, use for that. And a resource library. These resource, uh, resources are listed by publish date. They're searchable by type, country, issue, and language. And the um, final client I'd like to go over is Knowledge for Health. k for health is a USAID-funded organization. They manage and distribute evidence-based information and tools to provide health care uh, health services in developing countries. What that actually means is that by providing health information in audience-friendly fashion to multiple people groups around the world, they're able to help save lives and create sustainable practices, health practices in developing countries. They're run by the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Communication Programs. So we worked with them to improve their web products and to redesign their primary web presence. And during that process, we discovered the following items that they would need for their site. An image carousel. Uh, this space is, again, allowing them, like the previous examples, to quickly visually communicate to their users. A news section. Uh, this is another good example of Drupal customization. The news section here, like the previous example, is presented in a blog style chronologically, whereas the first example is searchable by categories and date range. Profile pages on k for health site include an image, bio copy, and blog post links. And program pages. This presents a zoomed in view of the map specific to that area. So we see here Ethiopia yeah. with uh, the map of Ethiopia. Um, the mapping, this one on k for health site operates similarly to that of ICFJ. So you just click on a point on the map and it takes you directly to the program associated with that area. And finally, a resource library. Much of what k for health does is to provide resources around the world. So these are searchable by type and topic. So through the three site examples, ICFJ, ICTJ, and k for health we, we see that one of them is journalism, one of them is transitional justice, and one works in health care. So they all have different goals and missions, but they have very similar needs for their web presences. Each of these clients has specific and complex functionality that we obviously don't have time to get into, but I think it's good to um, just look at this idea of the commonalities and the differences and how we've been able to optimize both for the needs of the client. So during our work with k for health we learned that in addition to their own website, they're responsible for rolling out um, websites for affiliate organizations, their affiliates and USAID affiliates. So we had an opportunity to come on with that uh, project as well and to build a platform that allows their internal developers to roll out these microsites for their affiliates. It was during that process that we started to see these similarities and thought, hey, outside of USAID and k for health there's probably a number of nonprofits that could benefit from this platform. So with a lot of work uh, by our team and their team and uh, many other people, we looked through some of the work that we had done and came up with a list of consistent needs for nonprofit uh, sites. Can you go to the next one, thanks. <laughs> and this list is going to look pretty familiar. This is our list of consistently utilized nonprofit and NGO features um, an image carousel, news, multi author blogs, profile pages, program pages, mapping partner profiles, image galleries, and a resource library. 
So with a lot of intentional contribution from the K4Health team and our team at Atten and many different levels of many different organizations, we were able to release this platform as the open aid distribution on Drupal.org. We call OpenAid a turnkey website platform designed to help small NGOs and international development projects create cost-effective program-focused websites quickly. So Scott's going to talk um, more in detail about distributions and OpenAid and also about collaboration and contribution. Okay. Uh, before we get too far into OpenAid and how that works, I want to back up a little bit and talk about distributions. Um, is our people familiar with distributions in Drupal yet? Um, looks like maybe half of you. Uh, so distributions are relatively new to Drupal um, and we've had similar things in the past that we've gone by a few different names that we're kind of consolidating on how this works. Um, and this is the documentation on Drupal.org about what a distribution is. So I just want to read through this to give you kind of a technical overview. Um, it says distributions are full copies of Drupal that include Drupal core along with additional software such as themes, modules, libraries, and installation profiles. Um, so that, that's kind of the technical definition of distributions, but that doesn't really give you a great idea of why distributions are important and how they're going to change the way we work with Drupal. So I want to talk about why you should care about this. Um, and the first part of that is to talk about how Drupal works. Um, this is probably familiar to many of you as well. Um, there's an often used metaphor for Drupal that it's like a pile of Legos. So when you get a Drupal site, you have um, a bunch of different pieces, modules that you can put together, modules and themes and other things, but mostly modules that you can put together to make whatever you want with Drupal. But um, when you first install Drupal, it doesn't actually do that much. An initial Drupal install is kind of a blank slate to build whatever you want. So uh, Legos are cool, they're great, and Drupal's great. You can make houses and spaceships and dinosaurs or whatever you want. You can make whatever you want with Drupal too, but the downside of that is it takes a lot of work to find like the right pieces and put them together in the right ways. And we found that that work is um, especially hard for nonprofits, which have limited resources and want to put those resources as much as they can into their core work. Um, so that's kind of a problem that we've had in the past with Drupal that uh, especially affects nonprofits. So the alternative to this is kind of the Playmobil approach. And if you're not familiar, Playmobil is a product that comes pre-assembled. So um, if you want to make a dinosaur with Legos, you buy the dinosaur set or you buy just generic Legos and put them together. But if you want a dinosaur with Playmobil, you just go to the store and buy the pre-assembled dinosaur and you're done. You don't have to put it together and make it work like a dinosaur. It already does that. Um, and this is probably closer to how something like WordPress works. Uh, WordPress, when you install it, it's a pretty full-featured blog product. You, you, there, you can add more to it, but you don't generally have to add more to it. You can often just install it and start using it. Um, Unfortunately, the downside to that approach is that it's a little less flexible. If you buy a Playmobil dinosaur and you want to make it green or you want to make it bigger, you can't really do that with Playmobil. Um, and to a lesser extent, that's true of WordPress as well. You can install WordPress, but if you want to make it, if you want to make your blog have a map or um, have a donation system or something, that's much harder to do with WordPress because it's not as flexible and it's not as modular. Um, so this is where distributions come in and hopefully solve all of these problems. Um, distributions, I think, are like uh, pre-assembled Lego sets. So you buy them, well, you don't buy them, but uh, you get them and they already do something for you. You don't have to put them together to do what you want to do, but they also have the flexibility that you can take them apart and make your dinosaur bigger, make your Drupal site do something slightly different, but it already does something, so you get all of the advantages of both worlds, which is especially good, like I said before, for nonprofits that have limited resources. Um, so the idea of a distribution is um, the, a technical team can install it and um, administrators can immediately start using it without having to wait for any sort of custom coding. If you're doing custom coding, you can start using it while you're doing that and you don't have to wait on the technical process before you can actually get some benefit out of it. 
Um, so we've seen some ways that uh, nonprofits specifically are benefiting from distributions. And uh, for smaller nonprofits, the first way is kind of like what I talked about as the Playmobil approach. Smaller nonprofits, distributions are really great because you can just install them and use them. Um, you don't have to spend much time at all, if any, actually using a distribution in Drupal. Um, you can, like I said, customize beyond. So if you find a distribution that does almost what you want it to do, you can install it, turn it on, start using it, but then like do the, the last 10% or whatever of how you want it to work. Um, for larger nonprofits, uh, distributions are used like that, but they're also used in some other ways. Um, larger nonprofits get a big advantage out of distributions in kind of uh, filtering conversations around what they're doing. So um, it, if you go through the time to uh, talk about your organization's needs and your goals and pick a distribution that you think meets those needs and goals pretty well, then as you're having uh, requests that come in for additional uh, functionality that is desired, it, if you pick something that meets your needs and goals and you're talking about something that um, isn't accomplished by that distribution, that's often a good um, indicator that maybe you need to back up and talk about what you're trying to do and d is that actually part of our organization's goals. Um, that's kind of a non-technical advantage of distributions for larger nonprofits. Um, larger nonprofits also um, can use distributions, have the opportunity to use distributions as um, not so much a ready to use website, but a ready to build um, kind of development platform. Um, and this is actually, we're not a nonprofit, but this is actually what we do at Adden with distributions primarily. We have um, a custom distribution that we use internally that has all of the Drupal development tools that we use to build sites uh, pre-installed so that we, when we start building a site, we don't have to um, download and en enable views, for example. That's already there, and that saves us a lot of time at the beginning of a project. So. Um, for larger nonprofits that are rolling out a lot of different sites, this can save a lot of time building something that um, kind of does what you're going to do at the beginning of every project, and then you don't have to do that over and over again. Uh, like Lydia said before, this is also um, what we built for the k for health team. Uh, th they're rolling out a lot of sites for their affiliates, so we made something that would allow them to roll out those sites a little more quickly. We identified the common needs that they had and made something that accomplishes most of what they are using on any of their sites, and then they can uh, do that end customization without having to repeat the same steps over and over again. Um, and like Lydia said before, as we went through this process, we recognized that what we were building would be useful beyond k for health and their affiliates. Um, it, and we put some work into making it um, not just a development distribution, but an actual end user distribution. And that's what we eventually released as the open aid distribution. Um, so based on our experience working not only with k for health but with many of the other nonprofit organizations we've worked with, um, we're hopeful that, k, uh, that the open aid distribution is a tool that many uh, nonprofit organizations can use to kind of solve their base needs, if not all of their needs. Um, and fortunately, talking with the k for health team about this, um, they agreed to, that this would be a good idea to um, release this as a contribution on Drupal.org. So after we were done with their kind of internal project, we put some additional time into generalizing this approach um, into a, a platform that would hopefully be more useful to a, a wider community, and that's what we released as the open aid distribution. Um, so this is the list of features that OpenAid has, which hopefully by now looks really familiar. There's an image carousel, there's news, there's multi-author blogs, uh, profile pages, program pages, there's mapping, partner profiles, image galleries, resource libraries. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, OpenAid has some other capabilities beyond um, that kind of base level set of features including branding accommodation for logos, so organizations can um, put their own logos in there. We're not like, uh, it comes, OpenAid comes with like an OpenAid logo, but we don't expect anyone to actually run an OpenAid site with the OpenAid logo. We're assuming they're gonna replace that with their own logos. Um, there's customizable color schemes, so everyone can kind of brand the site to uh, go with their own look and feel. Um, 
automated translation using Translate This, which is especially useful for organizations working internationally so they can um, have content available to people speaking a variety of languages. Um, social media links, which almost everyone is using now. Um, and a mobile-friendly responsive design so that um, open aid sites look good not only on desktop and laptop computers, but they look great on tablets and mobile devices, which is increasingly important. Um, so this is kind of what uh, what it looks like to install OpenAid, but also what it looks like to install most distributions to kind of give you an idea of um, why distributions are useful. Um, so this looks a lot like the standard Drupal install process. Normally you have a standard install option and a minimal install option. And if you download a distribution, you'll have a, at least a third option. In this case, you have the OpenAid site option. After you choose that, you go through the same language and database setup that you would with any Drupal site. Um, and then you go to the, the list of modules that are being enabled by default. Um, OpenAid installs a little bit more than a standard Drupal site like in this initial process, but it doesn't actually do a lot more than Drupal. The big difference with OpenAid is what happens after this. Um, you get redirected to this page, which hopefully you can see. Um, this is a list of all of the functionality that is available in OpenAid, and the idea um, with OpenAid is that after you install it, you go through this list and decide what do you actually want to do with it. So it, if you want to do blogs, you turn on the blog feature. If, if you um, want to list your partners, you turn on the partners feature. Um, and after going through this list and deciding what do you want to do with it and checking the boxes next to um, the features that you want, you, you just click save and all of that functionality is immediately available. Uh, like I said before, you have the option to customize anything you want, um, but hopefully it c comes pretty close to meeting your needs and you can immediately start entering content and that content will show up on your site where you would expect it to and your, your site is hopefully quickly usable um, right after install. So I want to talk about some sites that um, have been built on OpenAid so far to give you an idea of kind of how distributions are used in practice. The first of those is um, the Global Health Mini University. And this site is an annual forum that brings together professionals working in um, global health. Um, and they do presentations somewhat like DrupalCon, I guess, uh, presentations highlighting uh, evidence-based best practices and kind of state-of-the-art information in, in the health industry. Um, so uh, OpenAid was designed as a, a web a platform for organizations to kind of promote their own work and talk about what they're doing, the good work that they're doing in the world. Um, but we found with the, the mini university site that it, it works just as well for this kind of event-based site that uh, has many of the same needs as an organization. So you can see for they're using the image carousel feature not to show images of the work they're doing, but to show images of the event that they did, that they've done previously to kind of attract people to the next event. And they're using what we're calling the hero statement feature over on the right there to um, rather than to talk about their organization, it talks about the event and gives dates and information about when the event is happening, using latest updates to give updates on the event, and they're using the partners feature to list the event sponsors. So it, we were uh, happy to see that um, OpenAid was proving useful kind of in this context that we hadn't previously planned on it being used in. Um, the next site I want to talk about is the mHealth Working Group site. Um, mHealth is a collaborative effort by 11 different organizations to promote the use of mobile technology in the health industry. So they work to build capacity, encourage collaboration, and share knowledge about how mobile technology can work within a larger global health strategy. And of course, one of the uh, most important features of OpenAid that was useful for them is the um, responsive design, of course they're trying to promote uh, the use of mobile technology, so they need a site that works well on mobile devices. And OpenAid um, just does that out of the box, so they don't have to do anything to get that advantage. Um, the mHealth Working Group site also, like I said, has um, a, a, a lot of different organizations working together. Um, they ha they're doing 100 different projects in 50 different countries, and um, they're working 
together with organizations like Catholic Relief Services, um, K for Health, Save the Children. Um, so one of the big issues that they have content wise is how do they promote all of these different organizations and like in a way that gets them all enough attention that it's worth their uh, investment in this effort. Um, one way OpenAid does that is with this partners page um, that is just a page that lists all of the partners with their logos and links to their sites. To, if someone's specifically interested in who's behind this, they can go here and see them. Um, another way OpenAid does this is with this partners sidebar um, interface. And this is a, a scrolling interface of, again, all of the partners, but it takes up a little less space, so it allows them to put it throughout the site. So if you're just looking at some other content, you might notice the one of the partners, and that kind of gives some increased visibility to the people who are contributing to this work. Um, mHealth also uses OpenAid's resource library, and they're using the optional integration with Apache Solar, which you can see over on the right there. That gives them um, a, a listing of the, the different types of resources that they're sharing and like how, how many and that allows them to filter down um, and kind of in a more of a browsable interface with Apache Solar. Um, so they're using that to share things like their meeting minutes and presentation slides as well as um, documents that they've specifically created to share so that um, that kind of gives them some increased transparency and lets people see how their work is happening, not just what they're doing, but like what how they're doing it. Um, finally, I want to talk about the Malaria Free Future site. Um, this is one of the first sites that launched on the OpenAid platform, and um, I think it's a good example of uh, how you can kind of customize uh, a distribution like OpenAid to uh, work more specifically with your organization's needs. So Malaria Free Future um, is an organization seeking to uh, I improve control of malaria, and they work with public and private organizations in uh, Ghana, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda. And their goal is to scale up malaria control and kind of solve the malaria problem. Um, and the first thing you can see here, if you can see that, um, is that they've uh, significantly changed the navigation of OpenAid that you get initially. Um, for example, proje projects, what we're talking, what we're calling projects for um, the Malaria Free Future organization, um, those are all country specific, so they're referring to those as country programs, which is a little more um, in line with the type of language that their their uh, visitors would expect. They've also added a few um, items to the navigation that are specific to the the focus of their organization. So they have a um, United Against Malaria navigation item, which of course doesn't uh, come with open aid because that's not something that everyone needs, but um, it's something that they specifically need, and they're able to easily add that to the navigation and kind of work it in with the rest of what comes with OpenAid out of the box. Um, like I said before, they're working in uh, several parts of Africa specifically, so they're using the mapping feature in OpenAid already zoomed in on the specific areas where they're working, which allows, rather than having a global map that only has points in a specific area, they've zoomed that in on the area that um, they're working in so people can click on Tanzania and see the work that they're doing in Tanzania. Um, so that's kind of like how you can change OpenAid and some of the ways people are using OpenAid. Um, we've set up a demo site at openaiddistro.org with everything that OpenAid does turned on. So if you want to play with that, you can see uh, everything that OpenAid does. And that also, uh, that, that's as much as possible a bare minimum install. Of course, we had to add some like sample content so that you can see it. But this is pretty close to what you get like if you just download and install OpenAid. Uh, speaking of which, OpenAid Distro also has a link to where you download OpenAid, which is just the project page on Drupal.org. So if you want, you can download it and install it yourself. And hopefully, that is a quick process to see. Um, what OpenAid could do for you. Uh, we're, of course, uh, excited about OpenAid and uh, how people can use OpenAid, and we have some flyers and buttons up here if you're also excited about it. Um, but we recognize OpenAid is not the solution for everyone or even all nonprofits. That's not at all our goal. Um, we really want to 
focus on is uh, open as an example of using distributions because we think distributions is a great solution for um, a lot of organizations including a lot of nonprofits um, and there are some other great distributions that are specifically interesting to nonprofits um, there are over 400 distributions on Drupal.org right now and um, here are a few that you might be interested in uh, if you're working for or with nonprofits um, Open Outreach is a distribution specifically focused on kind of grassroots and activist organizations. Um, so if that's the kind of work you're doing, you should look at that. Um, Open Public is a distribution focused on government and public policy work. Um, so if you're doing that kind of work, that's a good thing to look at. Um, and Julio is one of the few distributions that doesn't start with the word open. Apparently they didn't get the memo that that's what we're all doing. Um, there's no reason uh, distributions need to start with open. I was just kidding. Uh, so it, Julio is focused on e education and school work. Um, so if you're doing stuff in the education sector, Julio is um, something you might want to look at. Um, like I said, there's over 400 distributions on Drupal.org, um, and they solve a lot of problems that um, many organizations have. But of course, they don't they don't solve every problem. Um, distributions don't quite uh, do everything yet. So that raises the question of what do you do if you if you look for a distribution that solves your problems and you don't find something. Um, what I want to encourage you to do is make your own distributions. Um, beyond uh, distributions in Drupal, one of the big things we want to encourage is um, nonprofit contributions back to Drupal and making a distribution is uh, a great way to do that. Um, I'll talk a little more, more about um, kind of the things you want to look out for in doing that, but I want to be clear, uh, it, it's a lot of work to make a distribution, it's, um, and like I said before, you m may think you don't have the time to do that. Um, one of the great things about the open source community, and specifically the Drupal community, is that you don't have to do that work by yourself. Um, it, there's a lot of other organizations that have similar needs, um, and probably a lot in this room. Um, so just to like kind of demonstrate that, um, uh, who here is working with an organization that is uh, membership focused, like you have members of your organization? Okay, so a few of you have that need and might want to work with each other. Um, who here is doing uh, uh, advocacy or like petition based work? Couple people. So you should all look around and see who else is raising your hand. Those are the people you want to work with. Um, so those are just uh, I don't know, a couple general level needs of nonprofits. And um, obviously, this is a relatively small sampling of the larger Drupal community. So the point I want to make here is that there, there's other people who are trying to solve the same problems you are. and we could all be working together more to, to solve these problems and we can get a lot out of that. Um, that brings us to collaboration. So that's, uh, like I've hopefully indicated, that's sometimes easier said than done. Um, collaboration in the Drupal community means we can save a lot of time and money and um, often find better solutions than we would on our own. But the first part of that is uh, finding other people to work with. Find who are you going to collaborate with. Um, and that can sometimes be difficult to do. There's so much opportunity in the community to um, find commonly needed solutions and work with each other. But the first step is uh, figuring out where to get started. Um, fortunately, we have Drupal.org for that. Uh, Drupal.org is uh, a great place to find other people doing similar work and to find uh, other people who have already done work that you need to do. Um, there's thousands of active projects on Drupal.org and there's people talking about creating new projects and people working to solve new t problems with technology. Um, the slogan on Drupal.org and kind of the slogan of Drupal is come for the software, stay for the community. But you could really just come for the community. The community alone in Drupal is uh, useful enough by itself. And it's a huge community full of all sorts of awesome people, which hopefully you've experienced at DrupalCon somewhat. Um, and it's also made up of a bunch of smaller communities that um, 
a lot of people working with Drupal kind of miss out on that. Um, there's hundreds of groups on groups.drupal.org focused on uh, kind of specific interest groups. And I want to uh, encourage you to get involved in some of these that are specifically relevant to nonprofit interests. So uh, there's a Drupal and education group. If you're doing any sort of education work, I'd encourage you to get into that. Um, there's a Drupal for government group. If you're doing anything that interacts with government work, that's a good place to go. Um, hopefully, almost everyone in this room has a reason to join the Drupal for Good group. But just in case you don't, if you're working for one of those rare nonprofits that's focused on evil, there's also a Drupal for Evil group, uh, which I think is mostly a joke. But it's uh, it's fun to see what kind of stuff, what kind of conversations happen in that group. Um, there's also groups for most of the distributions we've talked about, talking about how they're going to move those forward. So there's an open outreach group, a Julio group, and um, we're just starting an open aid group. Um, beyond groups on groups.drupal.org, um, I'd encourage you to get involved in issue queues. Uh, if you're doing Drupal work, you're using modules. And if uh, you look at the modules you're using, or even modules you're thinking about using, you have a ton to gain from getting to know the people who make those modules so that when you need to interact with them, you have an established relationship with them. Um, and so the first thing is to go to Drupal.org and just look through the projects and find the projects that you're actually using. Um, and the next step is to start interacting with those projects in the issue queue. Um, a lot of people with uh, less technical knowledge think that they shouldn't be there, they shouldn't be doing that. But even going in to an issue queue and saying something as simple as, like, this is what I'm trying to do. I don't see a way to do this with your project. Even if it's not um, specifically mentioned as a feature, uh, that kind of input is incredibly useful for um, project maintainers to kind of get ideas of what people want to be doing um, and kind of start conversations about what, what's going to happen next in the Drupal community. Um, more generally, uh, I think a lot of people get into nonprofit work because of ideas like this. This is a quote from uh, Gandhi. It's, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, and I would encourage you to apply the same sort of approach to your Drupal work. Um, so you don't have, just like you, you, you're not waiting around to improve the world, you're actually doing something about it. You don't have to wait around for anything to happen in the Drupal community. All you have to do is say, like, I want to see this happen. It's not going to, like, magically appear, but um, there's no reason to wait. The Drupal community uh, gives everyone a lot of opportunity to uh, create change and, like, influence how Drupal works. So I would encourage everyone to uh, take advantage of that. Um, beyond uh, groups and issue queues and distributions, um, there's several other good ways to get involved in the Drupal community. One is IRC. Um, if you're not already on IRC, you might have no idea what it is. It's kind of a simple chat system that is used pretty heavily by the Drupal community. Um, and there's dozens of chat rooms where people are talking about the Drupal work they're doing. And that here's a couple that are specifically relevant to people working with nonprofits. Um, there's a Drupal NGO channel on IRC, and there's a Drupal EDU channel. Um, and IRC allows you to do like real-time chat with people all over the world who are doing similar work to you. So it's a great place to um, have more, more direct communication with people uh, in real time. Um, another great place to do that is local meetups. Um, most uh, larger communities have a, a monthly or more often Drupal meetup. Um, and if you're working somewhere that doesn't, you should start one. Um, local meetups uh, are less likely to have people who are doing the, the type of work you're doing, but they'll have a lot of people working in Drupal who can answer questions or give you suggestions on how you might solve problems with um, the work that you're doing in Drupal. Um, and you can find uh, local meetups, again, on groups.drupal.org. Um, another great place to get together and, like, start talking to people who are doing similar work is events like this, like DrupalCon. Um, we're kind of coming up to the end of DrupalCon now. But there's still this afternoon um, to, there's still an opportunity to like 
create boffs, um, birds of a feather discussions, and get together, invite people who um, have similar interests to work together with you. Um, and there's also plenty of opportunity for hallway conversations. If you saw other people raise their hand with similar interests to your own, just walk up and start talking to them, find out what they're doing, talk about what you're doing, and uh, hopefully start making stuff together. Um, however you get involved in the Drupal community, I encourage you to um, start with the most general needs possible. It's really easy to get sidetracked um, as soon as you find out that you have slightly different interests, but um, we found the best way to do this kind of work is to start with common interests, um, solve your common problems first, and then once you have a solution that will attract more people who have that kind of general need and um, then you can find people who have more specific needs and get gradually more specific and eventually find that person who is doing the exact work that you're doing. But if you, if you, look, for the, if you look for that perfect match up front, you probably won't find it. So um, I'd encourage you to start general and get slowly get more specific. Don't focus on the specific stuff at first. Um, so after you've worked with the Drupal community and made something, another great thing to do is to contribute it back. Um, Many organizations, and I think specifically nonprofits, are using Drupal um, but not contributing back. And the reason for that is that it takes a lot of time and effort and money to contribute back. Um, but you also can get a lot out of that. So I want to talk about how you can hopefully make that work. Um, and the first part of that is to recognize that contributions won't just happen. Um, you, you have to be very intentional about it. Um, if you just, um, I don't know, if, if you kind of uh, think that contributions would be nice but don't take any, uh, don't, don't put any thought into how you're actually going to make that work, it very likely won't happen. Um, so OpenAid, as an example, started as an idea on our project team, like, hey, maybe we should contribute this. Um, but it eventually required the buy-in from a lot of different people in five different organizations. And... Um, that's a lot of communication overhead, so it's very important to kind of get your, um, your message together before you start talking about it. Um, it. It can be a hard sell to say, hey, let's take this thing that we've put a lot of time and energy into making and give it away for free. Um, that, fortunately, with OpenAid, that um, the organizations we're working with, K4Health and USAID, were very receptive to that. Um, but a lot of people aren't if they're not already familiar with the idea of open source. Um, so it, here's some, some ways I encourage you to talk about that that are, um, can get better receptions. Um, first, uh, focus on the overlap between the goals of your organization or the organizations that you're working with and um, open source ideals. Um, a lot of nonprofit organizations, if you look at your mission statement or the mission statement of the nonprofits you're working with, will say something about um, promoting the greater good and collaborating with others. And that's exactly what open source contributions are. They're collaborations towards the greater good. Um, second, uh, contributions to open source are great PR. Um, Organizations that contribute to open source uh, kind of position themselves as um, innovators in their in their sector and kind of thought leaders. Um, if if you're putting out there something out there that other people are using, then they'll look to you to kind of drive the direction of your your market. Um, finally, and uh, perhaps most importantly, there's money in contributions. Um, like Lydia said before, a lot of uh, grant funders are looking specifically for open source contributions um, and prefer giving money to organizations that are doing this kind of contribution. Um, it, it's a lot better for them to give money to you to help both your organization and dozens or hundreds or thousands of other organizations rather than just only helping your organization. Um, as an example of this, uh, we've done some work with the Knight Foundation and are, are very familiar with them. They do a lot of um, journalism and uh, technology funding. Um, and this is a quote from their blog um, that says, grants to nonprofits have an open source requirement 
any software developed with grant funds has to be open source. If a grant is made to a business, both the initial and future releases of the, of the code need to be open source. So in this case, they're actually requiring open source contributions to get money from them. Um, many other uh, grant funders are uh, kind of happy about open source, but not going as far to require it. But the, the um, I don't know, the, the money is definitely on the side of preferring uh, open source contributions to not. So you have a lot to gain money-wise from that. Um, so hopefully as you start talking about how you're going to contribute, you can be confident that other organizations are already doing this successfully and kind of integrating it into their overall strategy. Um, and hopefully all of this kind of gives you an idea of uh, some confidence that um, there's uh, money available in working with Drupal with nonprofits. There's the technology is getting better and better for um, doing this work efficiently and quickly. Um, and there's definitely a huge community here um, eager to help with this kind of work. Um, and like Lydia said before, this uh, like using the web effectively has never been more important and it's not likely to get less important. So um, Drupal's hopefully a, a good place for you to start thinking about and um, figuring out how to do that well. And we have uh, a little time for questions now. Um, we'd also love to hear what everyone else is doing if you're working with distributions or what your experience has been with contributions or like how you're working with Drupal with nonprofits. Um, I think we'll not use that mic and I'll just repeat questions so that we get them recorded. Anyone? Yeah, um, so open, with OpenAid, um, we're displaying projects, which is like the most general term we could give, because everyone wants to map something slightly different. But most people, so there's two main things people want to map. One is where they're working, and one is where they're located. Um, and so the more common need that we identified was where they're working. So we, we called that projects. But I mean, you could take projects and make that where you're working, or where you're located. Um, the, as far as the technology we're using for that, we have in the past, and OpenAid comes with a, an open layers solution. Um, and uh, I think the default design of that is using uh, Mapbox, if you're familiar with that, um, which, which the, the specific tile set we're using is semi-transparent. So you can, that the, the color branding of OpenAid uses, follows through to the map as well. So we're using a semi-transparent background, and then you just put a color behind it, and that um, follows through. I don't know if that's clear enough, but um, that that color influences the kind of the texture of the map. Um, recently, we've been working more with uh, more specific mapping solutions. Open Layers is kind of a um, I don't know. It, it aims to solve all mapping problems, and it uh, can sometimes be a lot of uh, code overhead. Um, we've been working a lot with, uh, for example, Leaflet recently. And that doesn't do as much, but it does it uh, more quickly. Yeah. I don't know if that's, hopefully that's helpful. Oh, sorry. I said I was going to repeat questions that I didn't. So the question was, uh, <laughs> now that I answered it all, the question was, what are we doing with mapping? Uh, how are we doing that, I think? Where is it? Uh, what? 12 o'clock outside the state monastery because there was a session yesterday, but um, I missed it. So I have another one today at 12 for Drupal in Academia. Um, Drupal in Academia meet up at 12 outside the St. Monic's room. In this building. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, tried to uh, install OpenAid during your presentation. It was Yay. easy to do Yay. with the <laughs> download of the package, but it did not work with Rush. 
Really? Um, do it should not work. I don't know if it might be my setting here, but I don't just wanted to let you know it. It worked perfectly, perfectly with downloading the zip file and unpack it and it all the rest. So uh, his comment was he installed OpenAid while we were talking. Uh, it worked well with the package download, but not well with Drush. Um, that's, I, so like I said, uh, making distributions <laughs> takes work. Um, and it's also uh, new in how much work? Yes. Um, I, I think that depends on what you're doing. Um, we've. Like, so I said we have our own like internal development distribution. Um, that didn't take that much work because we've just kind of like, as we want to add new things to it, we've just done that in bits and pieces. And that's not something that we've like set aside work to do. We've just slowly built that up um, internally. Um, something like OpenAid, um, that it's hard to say because we, that came out of, um, we had a an actual schedule for the work for like most of the work on that, but then we did some additional work in kind of the as we had time. Um, gosh, I don't. Ken, do you have any estimate on how much time we put into that? Definitely weeks of work, um, if not months. Uh, so, um, but what I was saying is, um, distributions are also kind of new on Drupal.org and. We're still kind of working out the kinks of making distributions work. Um, part of which is like di distributions get packaged on Drupal.org with Drush, but you need a very specific setup of Drush to make that work. So that might be the issue: is that you might need to upgrade your Drush. Um, but <laughs> this, I probably shouldn't be trying to do support here. <laughs> uh, anyone else questions or want to share your experience? No? Okay. Sorry. Oh. I was just going to ask about the, the look and feel. Um, a lot of the examples we get have pretty much the same layout and the same feel, but it's like just different uh, color schemes that you use for a lot of the pages. Yeah. Um, so OpenAid has kind of a, in, I don't know if, <laughs> Uh, OpenAid has our, the, our designer is here as well, so I thought he might want to answer. Um, I, it's hard to uh, OpenAid definitely has like uh, it. It's general enough that you can uh, probably recognize an OpenAid site, and, and but at the same time, that's just your basis, and your uh, you can definitely customize it from there if that's useful for you. Um, the idea is just that it gives you something you can use that looks good um, out of the box. And if you if um, if heavily branding your organization visually is important to you, you're probably going to want to do some significant customization because, uh, like you said, open aid sites definitely have um, kind of a common look to them. Just like uh, I don't know a, a d default Drupal site out of the box, you can kind of recognize that just by looking at it. Um, so yeah, and we're definitely welcome to input on how we can make that more customizable. Um, but yeah, you're right that uh, if you want a very specific look, you're probably going to, you'll need to do some uh, customizing there. Oh, sorry, I did it again. Uh, so the, <laughs> the comment was that, uh, the, I, or maybe the question was about customizing the look and feel. Um, right now, it is just changing the logo and um, shifting the color scheme. Those are your only options with the theme that comes with OpenAid. But you can change that theme if you want. Yeah. Um, I noticed there's nothing about copywriting in your OpenAid system. Do you have any experience with that? With fundraising? Yeah, because most of the people do some of that software. Yes, yes, they do. Um, so the question was about uh, fundraising. That is not. That's definitely on our um, feature list for OpenAid for future features. Um, fundraising is complicated because you're right that most nonprofits need to do that, but there's a wide variety of ways in which they do that. Some take direct donations. Some have some sort of membership or subscription system. Um, some are actually selling, uh, s selling some sort of uh, product or membership product. Um, so, and there's also um, 
a lot of nonprofits are already working with specific payment processors. So it's hard to find a solution for that that's generally useful. And like I said, we're kind of focusing on the, the common solutions first. Um, but yeah, we're definitely looking at ways that we can do that in a way that will be useful for a variety of organizations. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Open Outreach, you might want to look at that. I'm not sure if they have some sort of um, way to accept donations in the Open Outreach distribution. Um, but yeah, that that's definitely a problem that needs solving, but it's also a hard problem to solve for everyone at once. So good question. I don't have a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, the payment part is the hardest one. It's a, it's a, it's done in a, in a way of Kickstarter. And, uh, and we used it, uh, we used Google Fund as well for that purpose as well. So, uh, you know, what, yeah, what? Uh, in case anyone didn't hear that or for the recording, um, he said that there, he's working on or with a uh, distribution that uh, does crowdsource funding, I guess. In a way of, um, in a, in a way of the Kickstarter. Yeah, sort of like Kickstarter, um, which is one way to take money. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in that, you should talk to that guy. <laughs> Uh, anything else? I think we're actually past time now. So uh, thanks, everyone, and we're happy to answer more questions if you'd like to talk personally. <laughs>